And now I have the continuing pleasure, I get to introduce Kate a lot, to introduce uh, Kate Edwards, formerly of the IGDA Seattle Board of Directors, but she's now moved on to bigger and better things. Kate is the Executive Director of the International Game Developers Association Worldwide. Kate? Thank you. So yeah, I flew all the way in from South Lake Washington to be here today. So, <laughs> but um, I'm going to make this pretty quick because we want to wrap up this morning a uh, couple of keynote sessions, and um, I'm just going to speak to you from a higher level um, uh, about game creators being advocates for what they do. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you by now are familiar with the IGDA. I'm sure you're all members already. Yeah, right. But uh, you should be. But um, what I want to talk about are four key areas really briefly about areas that the IGDA focuses on and in general we as game developers this is the kind of stuff we should be thinking about so obviously advocacy meaning you know focusing on um, our jobs and what's important to our jobs and I guess I should lean that forward um, and being aware of what's going on around us, what affects our industry, what affects our jobs, uh, issues in legislation and all that kind of thing. Um, obviously professional development is very key all the way from the very beginning stages of careers to the very end of, of careers or people who transition out of the industry. Um, all of the issues related to professional development, I mean everyone should be focused on continually improving their skills and improving, you know, um, you know basically their craft. Um, networking and community obviously is extremely important. I mean, community is partly why we are in this room. Um, you know, in the community, whether it's the IHD Seattle or whether it's other groups that are around, um, it's really important to be connected. And of course, the international reach, which I'm going to speak to this. Um, this happens to be a very important issue to me as a geographer, at least sort of in the other side of my brain. Um, so we often talk, we often hear about walled gardens, and you know, and this is just a graphic that doesn't have to do the game industry necessarily. Necessarily, but you know the walled garden approach. I sometimes look at the game industry as being something like this, where we are in a garden of our own making, where we are wandering around within our own walls, kind of a little bit, somewhat oblivious to what's going on outside. Not oblivious because we don't know. It's oblivious because, at least in my view, being in this position in particular, hearing a lot of feedback from game developers um, all over the place is that they just don't care what's going on outside the wall necessarily. So we're going to make our games and just keep checking them over the wall and have the dollars come flying back over. Um, so let's talk about a few issues that, um, you know, um, <laughs> this issue, <laughs> this issue um, you know, obviously over the last several months following the Newtown incident, it reignited the issue about uh, violence in video games and the whole debates going on around it. You know, we all know about the Vice President Biden's meeting in the White House. Um, inviting the ESA and others to go there. Um, you know, there's a very serious issue, obviously. Now, there's a lot of things, you know, behind this. I mean, if, you know, if, if in fact it was true that, you know, gun-related murders are related to video game violence, this is the trend line that we should be seeing across different countries. Um, but the reality is this is what it looks like. Um, you know, since the uh, introduction of video games and the spending per capita. So it's, it's basically completely opposite of what the perception is out there. Um, you know, now I know a lot of game developers rail against the ESRB folks here in the U.S. You've got Ciro in Japan, you've got Peggy in Europe, you've got, you know, USK in Germany and all these other rating boards across the world. And I know a lot of developer friends who are just like, oh, ESRB, we got to get this ready for them and, you know, but, you know, you can look at it however you want, but I mean, the ESRB, if you don't know, was created by the Entertainment Software Association basically to self-police the industry, because if we don't self-police the industry, then what we get is this, is a bureaucracy that basically is determined to more or less legislate what is moral and what is ethical and what is, you know, what content should be or shouldn't be. They want this kind of thing to be on our games. Um, to make sure people are safe, um, you know, so this is, that's kind of the direction that will very clearly go. All of this issue came up again post Newtown, um, the whole re uh, igniting about putting uh, labels and warnings, all that kind of stuff. But a lot of game developers say, why should I care? Because the Supreme Court last year said that uh, games are, you know, are allowed freedom of speech. They are an art form. 
so on and so forth. And so everyone's kind of glowing in that post SCOTUS, you know, moment um, and happy that, you know, we, uh, we don't have to worry about it anymore. It's, it's decided by the Supreme Court. Um, but the reality is that, it, yeah, it's decided in law. It's not decided in public opinion. It's not decided in the court of a public perception. And, um, and the reality is that we are facing a huge uh, misperception, as you know. Now, I do believe very firmly that with a lot of sociological changes that it will happen generationally. We will see changes over time. You know, I'm still waiting for that moment in a presidential debate when one of the questions is, what was your favorite game and how did it influence you? Someday. But um, we'll get there eventually. But we still have this issue that we're facing, so um, it's, it hasn't gone away. And the issue is with developers, do we care? You know, and so I ask this question, I don't have time to actually ask you, but just kind of, uh, you know, pose it for you to think about. When's the last time you actually contacted lawmakers to voice your opinion about legislation or other issues as an individual game developer? And you went to them, you wrote a letter, you contacted your local office, whatever it is. When's the last time you did it? Um, let's talk about other issues. Um, we've seen some great examples of female characters in games, um, or uh, let me say, if not great, but, but good ones. Um, we've also seen ones that are, you know, increasingly, you know, maybe not so great. Um, <laughs> So, you know, this is a continuing issue. We all know about this. We hear about it all the time, the issue of sexism, the issue of stereotyping. You know, we see characters who have gone through changes, which you, some debate are better, some debate are, are still the same old thing. Um, but when's the last time working on a game, if you were in a, you saw something that one of the artists had created or a designer came up with an idea, when's the last time you raised a concern about it and said, you know, I don't know if we should do that or maybe we should try this instead or do we need another white guy in that role? Can it be someone else? Um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, all it takes is opening the mouth and, and voicing concern. Um, we also know about issues, I'm sure a lot of you have seen this video, so you want to, you know, you want to be in the game industry. It's pretty funny if you haven't seen it. Um, and, um, or, you know, stuff like Game Dev Story, where, you know, very appropriately show the people in crunch mode on fire. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's kind of a sad commentary because, you know, it's, it's built into even game, stuff like Game Dev Story because it's, it's meant to be, you know, this is expected, this is what happens within the industry. You know, but in reality, outside the game industry, it's called poor project management. Um, and for some reason in the game industry, crunch mode is worn with a badge of honor. Like, oh, I remember crunch mode 2004 during Thanksgiving. That was awesome. You know, and now, oh, my kid's six years old now. So, um, you know, it's, you know, so when's the last time you experienced it on your job? I mean, is it expected in your workplace? Do you voice concerns or uh, opinions about it? You raise the issue to management. Um, you know, this is a serious thing because we're talking about quality of life and we all want to attain a certain quality of life that doesn't drive us into the ground by the time we're, you know, um, not even halfway to a midlife crisis. So, um, you know, that's one of the things we have to be thinking about, stepping back and saying, you know, I love my work, I love it to death, but I don't want to put, have it put me to death. So, um, and of course we have community. We all love getting together with fellow developers and communing with one another. And, you know, it's really important, it's vital. Um, every industry has this kind of camaraderie and we love it. You know, mentorships are very important as well. And um, so, you know, when's the last time you mentored someone, someone who's been in the industry for a while? Or if someone approached you and said, hey, can you help me with this? No, I'm too busy, I'm sorry. Um, or sought out a mentor if you feel like you want to improve your skills or find a different angle to be in the industry. Um, there's a lot of people out there with a tremendous amount of knowledge. Um, or attended an IGDA chapter meeting or even other meetings that are around um, that are not necessarily IGDA and just, you know, be there and, and commune with others. Of course, most of us, you know, you probably can't because you're in crunch mode. But, um, you know, or help the student or colleague with some advice, you know, or a student comes with, hey, I would love to get into the game industry, what should I do? I mean, I'm sure most professionals have heard that. I'm sure most students have asked that question. Um, but, you know, some people I've seen um, 
tend to just like, oh, geez, not another question from a student. It's like, yeah, but you were one of those one day, you know. And so it's just like just trying to pass pass it on and pay it forward. Um, so, oh, sorry, that was my questions. Okay, so another another issue is about the international angle. So, you know, the, the game industry future, whether we like it or not, or realize it or not, is global. So this is kind of speaking more to my background as a geographer and all that, so I gotta put a plug in here. But localization roughly accounts for about 50% of the global industry's revenue. It comes from localized versions of your games. So PricewaterhouseCooper, every year they do projections on where the game industry is heading, and I know others do it as well, but this is just one example. But, you know, they, they're showing still, you know, growth that happening most all of this growth is happening outside North America um, you know we're seeing that the you can see there from the the chart from you know 2007 to a couple years from now the industry revenue has doubled basically doubled um, for where it used to be in 2007 so um, it's pretty significant and but like I said a lot of this growth is occurring outside the United States on some individual game developer companies, publishers, their local revenue can vary anywhere from like a third of their total revenue, as even as high as 70% of their total revenue comes just from localization. You know, so they made a couple games, but then they localized it into figs. Everyone knows what figs is, right? French, Italian, German, Spanish. Then often Japanese, Chinese, Russian, Eastern European languages. Um, that's a lot of revenue. So. So basically, the bottom line is designing for a global audience is not an option. That is what you do. You design content for global consumption these days because we all know the reality. It's like when you put your stuff out there, it's everywhere instantly. You know, that's the reality. Now, whether or not you realize that or care is irrelevant because they will care and they will, you know, they may want your game or they might find something in your game that's a problem. Like some of the cultural issues that happen, um, like historical issues. If you're putting this kind of stuff in your game, you may want to think, do a little bit more research about it using religious issues, ethnic or nationalities, the issues of inclusion, exclusion, that also goes for gender and stereotyping and cultural friction between markets, like you're selling a game in Korea that happens to piss off people in Japan or China and you might have an issue on your hands because then people in China and Japan may not buy your game because now you've only made friends with Korea. Um, or governments who have regulations like about maps and stuff, like how you might have a map in your game and it doesn't show Kashmir's Indian territory and you're trying to sell it in India and the government's going to ban your game, so you're kind of screwed. Um, so when's the last time you thought about how your content's going to be perceived internationally? Even if you don't intend for it to be international, you still have to think about it. You know, or do you even follow gaming trends in other countries? Um, you know, how many people know that the Middle East is one of the fastest growing gaming markets right now? It's, it's accelerating quite quickly. Um, so, just some last minute things, just to sum up, I, I think you should stand up and speak out. Don't be afraid, don't be complacent, because you might think that, well, no, that's what the ESA does. They're out there fighting for our industry, and they're in Washington, D.C. That's what the IHDA does. Well, the IHDA is, it's this, we're individual members, we're not, you know, we, we are speaking for ourselves. And to be honest with you, the ESA has approached the IGA saying, why, does, why don't your individual developers ever say anything? You know, like when they have, they're putting laws in the Connecticut legislature about, you know, uh, video game labels and stuff, why are they not on the steps of the Capitol in, in Connecticut complaining? Because that's their job is on the line. Their job is being affected by these decisions. <laughs> so let's solve crunch. Um, I encourage you to be in the community. I know that's one of the things, especially in creative spaces, where we love to collaborate, but then we love to go in our kind of mad genius labs and just stay in there and lock the door and work on our great projects, which is awesome. But I think it's really important to share and collaborate. And that's one of the things I've seen in the indie game community, was, is, which I think is awesome, so much collaboration um, that often goes on. And, and don't be afraid to share your wisdom. I mean, even a, a quick email reply to some people, to a student or to a colleague or something, can be so valuable sometimes. And just keep thinking about the rest of the world that's out there. They are, uh, they're definitely watching what you're producing, whether you know it or not. 
And, um, and that's all I have to say, basically. Just so you know, we have the IG Day Summit, which is a two-day event in conjunction with Casual Connect. It happens at the end of July. And you're more than welcome to come down to San Francisco and visit. Um, we all know it used to be here in Seattle, but it moved. And if you're interested in knowing more about the IGDA, you can go to IGDA.org and join, or you can just corner me and talk to me. So there you go. Thank you very much.